Uh, welcome to uh, another meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We meet every month uh, here. Um, the title is The Use and Abuse of Hayek's Ideas. But I think the uh, speaker's got something, a correction of Hayek himself involved as well. I that think so. Bring it over to I think Frank. so. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, you, scholars would have noticed that on the misuse of Hayek econo in economics is a sort of parallel to on the use of knowledge in society. A famous paper by Hayek, indeed said to be one of the most referenced of all um, economic papers. And I've read it several times, and all this other stuff, plainly, obviously. Um, so I, but I would have liked to have called it um, on the non-utility of ignorance in society. Uh -huh. There'll be a slight pause while the chairman adjusts the table. In any event, uh, philosophy first. Um, I am by degree a philosopher, only because I only took that because it was the easiest one to go for, and I didn't have the maths to do other things particularly, so, and I'd read all the stuff anyway, and I, I quite enjoyed it, and they didn't want any A-levels or anything, so, uh, and they gave me a full grant, and uh, uh, it was, uh, I think a pint was 60 pence. Anyway, in event, there were several advantages to going to a, such an august institution. So I went. So I have a degree in philosophy. So I'm no more a trained economist than, um, than uh, Adam Smith, uh, David Hume and Karl Marx. Well, I can't quite match them in all respects. Thank God. Um, uh, there are advantages to taking uh, an unconventional route uh, into economics and other matters. Um, rather like doing PPP at, at Oxford. People don't do it to, well, they, they learn things, I suppose. Even worse than that, that's the apply the things, I suppose. But uh, most students, as you would have noticed if you've been at university, say, what do I have to know? What do, what do, I, have to, what do I have to know? What do, I have to, what do I have to put in the answer? Not what's the truth, yes. particularly. I mean, they, it's a mixture of modesty and getting things right. They're not there to advance the discipline. They're there to get a degree, shag around, drink a lot, grow up a bit, and... and and get a job. So that's that's mostly what they do. Um, such eccentrics as ourselves, we we rather want to see what's going on and what what the truth is and uh, who's got the best arguments. You know, but, um, this is why we earn such piles <laughs> as we do now. Anyway, that's the way I went in via um, via philosophy. Though I had already read a fair bit of uh, anti-Marxian stuff, and by that time, which is uh, what was that? 1984, so I'd read read my Popper and uh, even uh, and Hayek and other things. So I was I was an anti-Marxian and a Popperian, um, and I ever since then, as long as it's secondhand and cheap, I've been reading uh, guides to philosophy, uh, economics, and um, introductions and histories of economic thought and the rest of it. So in some ways, I'm far more uh, wise or at least knowledgeable, about these things than many a, many a graduate student. Because they go in, they do the course, they specialise, they get out, they get together, they work for the state. Not always, but, but many do. Uh, but there are advantages to just sort of bumbling around and reading, uh, reading books because they happen to be cheap or available or well-written. And so, so you, don't, you don't get stuck in the ruts. It's, um, even if it's the right rut, for good Popperian reasons, it's good if someone else thinks differently, just to shake you up, just to ask awkward questions, and I, I, take, um, I take pleasure in all that. So I'm in the happy position of having no department uh, to um, <clears throat> be an embarrassment to, no, uh, no colleagues to, <clears throat> to think uh, badly of me. I can say what the hell I like, especially if I think it's uh, correct or true. So coming to Hayek, I already had um, Leibniz and other such persons under my belt. In other words, I was, uh, I was um, conversant with the idea of possible worlds, with the idea of compossibility, 
a friend of mine said there's no such word. I said, oh, there is certainly such a word. <laughs> certainly such a word as compossibility, even incompossibility. Well, in a possible world, there's a possible word that is incompossibility, but that's, that's taking us too far off, off the track, I think. Um, in any event, uh, the idea of Leibniz is there are certain things that hang together. So it's a kind of coherence. Um, as, a, as regards natural laws or states of natural affairs or even possible natural laws and possible uh, states of affairs, providing the note there is no contradiction in the, in the idea of them or the propositions relating to them, um, they, they hang together. Now, uh, coherence in that line is something I've followed up and through uh, studying economics on the side. So it made it much easier for me, reading the Austrian economists, some of whom were, I mean, take, a sh take a short way with general equilibrium, certainly. Ain't no such parson, they say, as general equilibrium. And some of them have grave doubts about individual equilibrium. In some sense, uh, Mises will say, well, if, if you're not uneasy, hey, it's... You're on easy street. You're not worried about anything. You have no problems to solve. Now, whether you're monitoring your position by looking about you and checking various other things, which looks like a kind of action to solve a problem, but you can see his point. And I come from that, started from that line, and I was also helped by Dennett, Daniel Dennett, on the intentional stance, which is his, it's a kind of, actually, a kind of mesianism. He doesn't know it. He you know, wrote, wrote a book review about the point, not that he should have seen it at all, but uh, the point with the intentional stance is you, um, you look to see what problems are being solved by apparently conscious activity and sometimes it's obvious because they tell you sometimes what they're trying to do, or from the, from the mere use of a tool in a certain manner you can say well that's what he's trying to do uh, it gets a bit tricky with mental illness and uh, a cry for help and other things so, or feigning, but that's unusual and uh, sort of uh, it can be parked in an annex. So the so the Mesian idea that you look to see what the problems are, what, what problems are being solved, it, yep, that, that's fine. Yeah, I can see that. But also reading the more um, outre of the Austrian e economists, I realised that I could go say with Lachmann, Shackle to the degree that I understand him and his kaleidoscope. But certainly, um, as regards uh, Lachman, who many in Austrians, certainly the American, some of the American Austrians, the uh, Rothbardians, I think is a crazed, um, crazed loon, uh, a nihilist. He doesn't say that there's equilibrium or ever-increasing proximity to equilibrium, such as, say, uh, who wrote in Entrepreneurship? Um, Schumpeter? No. <laughs> Uh, oh, the uh, Englishman who went to uh, English, Kirsten. Indeed, Kirsten. Uh, and Kirsten's good, and I like his stuff. But my view became, not certainly my view, but I was absorbing this stuff, and thinking it through too, is that there will be sometimes uh, less disequilibrium, if you like, or an approach to equilibrium in a sector, possibly, certainly in a life, uh, if you're, not, if you're not acting, you're not solving a problem, so therefore, in some sense, you're in equilibrium. Though I actually think that all humans, pretty much, all adults, when awake, it's a bit like the Irishman said, all conversation is either bragging or complaining. So I, I think that all, all being awake is either acting or prospecting. In other words, you're looking to see if you need to act. You very rarely just do that. That's why you can, we can be woken by a noise or something happening or what's that? What's going on? What's that? We are equipped to always see problems and ways possibly of solving them. So at the individual level, even when you're just dozing in, a, dozing in the sunlight, you are in a sense a producer. Uh, the sunlight is making you feel warm. That, that's good. You put yourself where you could receive the sunlight, so that's an act of production. You're listening out for alarms and excursions and things, so that's also um, that's that's the prospecting side, and that's an also another form of production. That's a sub form. 
So we're never, we're never in equilibrium. We can be between purchases with money as if that's the whole of economics, which sometimes some people give the impression that it is. Of course, it isn't. So you're always at it. And you're never at rest. Even when resting, you're even, even just, just sitting there. You will be woken by a noise. You will be, if someone says, do you want a beer? <laughs> you might revive interest. And it's, so that, that, that's not the individual side, uh, side of it. And the same goes for um, an supposed economy, society-wide system of uh, production and exchange, specialist production and exchange, which is that we're always uh, nowhere near equilibrium. Or rather, we're never at it and sustainably at it. Uh, this is important because, um, see, I can, without any embarrassment whatever, simply discard the idea of um, equilibrium. That's just one way I'm talking. Don't need that. That's, that's been hauled in from physics, trying to make economics look like a proper science and have, have maths in it and, uh, and data and stuff like that. Well, it may not be neat. It may not need that. Surely there's some other way of looking at it. Uh, coherent activities not getting in each other's way. This is, comes back to the idea of Leibnizian compossibility of activities. And that is pretty much what we do. So um, we're never in equipoise. We're never in balance. These things were dragged in from Newtonian mechanics and other things. The idea of you know, one force balancing another. Um, supply equaling demand. Now, in one sense, what was supplied equals what was demanded, but that's, that's extreme definition. That's not very interesting, uh, although true. <laughs> Has to be lived with. And so, um, so I thought, well, uh, surely the idea of coherence would be better. Uh, but I've spoken elsewhere, well, here, actually, on, uh, on the idea of social coherence. And is that entirely a good thing, like being good nationalists, being good this, being good the others? Um, that kind of coherence um, may I not have a lot to recommend it, but to refer back to Mr. Leibniz, Dr. Leibniz, Professor Leibniz, or Dr. Leibniz, uh, this coherence is more a matter of um, compossibility. And so instead of equilibrium, uh, I'm allowed to be uh, like this, because uh, as I pointed out, this isn't my profession. So I can, I can be ridiculous. I can say, I'm not, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it this way. Hard luck. By the time someone's thought differently, you can always chuck it out later. It doesn't really matter. But what harm does it do? What harm does it do? So instead of um, equilibrium or even coherence, because coherence suggests a kind of coming together, a, a gravitational pull, and that might go with a society or a nation or an economy. Smells of statism. <laughs> Got me suspicions about that. So why go that way? Well, why go that way? So instead, so I've moved down from, so now there's no general equilibrium. In a way, there's no individual equilibrium. It's just between actions, as if we, as if we ever are. Uh, so w w what's left? Well, funnily enough, it's a kind of um, uh, peaceful coexistence. Um, what we have is, is not economies, an economy, or rather, if you wish to have the term an economy, it's a, it's a set of producers under an interventionist regime. In other words, where there's policy, state policy, in a sense there's an economy. Not a good thing, but it's undoubtedly there. So it's this set of policies, or these taxes, these tariff barriers, whatever it might be, that makes that an economy, and I can't deny in that sense there are economies. But I like to pull back in the libertarian way and say, no, they're just economizers. We're all economizers, the whole world. Every one of us, every man, Jack and Jill, are economizers and producers. Uh, we are not helped by uh, interventionist governments or states making economies of us. In other words, having this policy here and a different policy over the border. So you see the point. So I've now, I've now gone from general equilibrium, you know, equilibrium, no, coherence, no. What's left? Well, it's, what's left is 
a peace or coexistence. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is uh, just go back to the dim and distant past when um, people started engaging in specialist production. It wasn't just it wasn't either or. It was they they made a lot of things for themselves, but some of the stuff they made they took to market, and uh, they found that in time, because other people are doing a similar kind of thing, uh, there became more specialism and less making of almost everything for yourself. And that meant, we didn't mean, if it took place, it meant there was a money good. That's, that's what money is good for. For trading. In to money, out of money, back into non-money. So, what mutually arises, as the Buddhists say, I believe, uh, is a population that is, has, there is private property, there is respect for private property, there is trade, there is, to some degree, specialist production, and there is money. Now, once we have that, this is getting to the Hayekian bit, uh, then what do we, what, what, what do we have? A word. We have plans, plans for production. We have prices. And the prices are of vital importance, as you will know from reading your, your Hayek and your Mises, that um, for there to be economic calculation, there must be prices, not simply something called prices. I mean, modern governments say they're using the, what they're using the market, they're using the price system by fixing the price of CO2 output or the price of electricity from this source compared to that source. Well, that's not, that's not using the market. It's sort of playing at the market, rigging the market, but it's not market prices doing the work because they're set by governments in the way of um, subsidies or, ta or taxes. But the peaceful coexistence idea is that, and this is where we get to Hayek again, uh, Hayek famously insisted that prices have work to do, that prices convey uh, information, that prices give you knowledge. And uh, being a philosopher, although we're not supposed to approve of what does that, what does that mean, or what is, what is questions, but I quite like some of those, and you know, it's not illegal. Yeah. So, so what is the information that's being conveyed by these, these prices? And um, I've looked, and I've thought, and I've said, well, um, um, well, if you're buying, it means something in opportunity cost. If you buy this, then you can't buy those other things. Uh, that's a kind of knowledge, but what well, isn't? It's the implications of what you're doing. I'm, I'm not sure it was given to you by the price. The fact that there is a price means that there are going to be consequences of, of buying a good at that price because you've had to part with the money. And, uh, we can see how that goes. But I, I then said, no, no, what is the knowledge that is being imparted? Hmm? And sometimes someone will, well, many of them will say, rapidly moving on, uh, a relative scarcity, <coughs> and they move on. And they think, hang on, hang on, woo, 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 woo. What's that mean? Relative scarcity. Well, the demand's gone up, <coughs> all the supply's gone down, or a bit of both or a complementary good has got much cheaper, therefore it's more worthwhile putting the two together. Uh, it, doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you anything in particular. I mean, you know you, you will buy or won't buy at those prices, that your production plan can remain unchanged or needs to be changed, but in itself it conveys nothing whatsoever. I mean, if you were told it's two, it's two watts, it's to buy a, this, but you don't know what a watts it is, and you don't know how many of them most people earn. And you don't know what the price of anything else is when it's two watts. It's what has been conveyed to you? Nothing will ever. You have to have an experience of living in that society of producers uh, to know that, well, that's a bit steep. Or if I buy that, I can't buy, you know, I can't, I can't feed myself for the week or whatever it might be. So it's the information conveyed by these mere numbers Although of vital importance in 
looking at a production plan and saying, well, that's, no, no, that's a non-starter. I, the costs are so high and the, no, 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 we can't do that. It is truly vitally important that there be market emerging prices, that there be sufficient competition that they are not merely set prices, the, the prices that no one can really set, that there's, there's come, they emerge. Now, in that sense, uh, certainly uh, we make use of these prices, but what do they tell us? The calculation tells us something. Price of inputs, price of, price of labour, rent, blah, 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 possible sales, market price, volume of sales at that price. No, no, that, that plan's off. That, that, that's no good. Other plans, because yeah, that's, that's got sort of a chance. You have to guess at the future prices and... You have to see whether your, your rivals are going to spring something on you. And, okay. But uh, that is um, not making use of... Uh, not, de not deriving knowledge from the price. A, a, a price movement, a mere price in itself, is entered into the calculation, and then the calculation tells you that maybe it's, it's a starter, it's worth proceeding with. But uh, in itself... Uh, it tells you nothing. It doesn't tell you what its future is going to be, for a start. That has to be guessed at. Now, there are things about the world. Like, was there a strike? Was there an earthquake? Is there a war broken out in that country? Um, can I see the reason why the price jumped so suddenly? Is it likely to come down again? Now, in other words, a price movement causes one to think, but it doesn't help one think. One has to think about other things that aren't simply that price. That price alone is uninformative. And even in a calculation, it's only the result of the calculation that, is of, that moves one to uh, carry on or, or change the plan. So I literally looked at the idea that prices contain information, convey information. What? 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 They have a number. It's vital that there's a number of units uh, in all, in all, there can't be calculation unless you can add, subtract, divide, multiply. I can do those. It's not much else. I can't differentiate. And in any event, th th that's important. But that, there simply have to be units. And there will be units or part units. It's possible to have a currency where no one actually has one. <laughs> Everyone has parts of one. But someone, and well, you know, it's quite possible. It just doesn't, it never occurs, I don't think. So um, we can now see that I've, I've been throwing things out, out of the Hayek kind of view. So what, what much is left? Well, prices coordinate. They coordinate. You find that everywhere. They convey information. Well, I'm not sure about that. So it's part of a calculation. They make, one, they make one think and find out, but they don't tell us what we had to go and find out. Like, why has the price gone up? How long will it go up for? Is there an, is there an alternative? So you can see they're not conveying an awful lot here. Um, but, but they coordinate. Uh, so being the philosopher who says, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by coordinate? Uh, what would they be without coordination? And then, then I realised that coordination is always with us. The most efficient, most efficient plans are not always with us, but given a private property economy, where private properties are acknowledged and accepted, and people don't evade one another, and they have certain, certain rights to deal with them, then we have this, as I've called it, peaceful coexistence. In other words, private property is a way of not getting in the way of each other. It's, that's what property, private property allows. There are problems when problems of the commons, problems of fish, but the usual problems arise because there isn't proper private property. Many so-called instances of market failure are failure to actually have a market. That's, that's how it goes. So we now have, um, it seems to me, we may not have the most effective uh, production scheme methods. These, these things do have to be learnt, and prices don't help one learn them. Prices help one look for them. That's, that's certainly true. Prices help one look for better methods, better sources, better, uh, better in, cheaper inputs or superior inputs. 
but prices don't convey the information. So, the, but what of the coordination? Aren't prices doing that? Well, no. <laughs> I'm on my property doing what I legally own in my property, and you're on your property doing what you believe may be yours. And, and the reason that it goes on together, mutually, at liberty, peaceful coexistence, is because we're not in each other's way, because precisely we are dealing with our own stuff. Now, there are things like, what if someone hires a hall ahead of the other one and he can't have his big exhibition and that was a bit conniving, but things like that can happen. Or if you're going down the motorway and one by chance gets ahead of you to whatever it is. It can happen that um, one steals a march from the other, but it's still peace. It's still, you know, it's not war, it's just commerce. It's just business. It's just business. No, no, that's, that is war, the mafia side of it. So I'm now stripping out general equilibrium, equilibrium, prices providing information. No, no, chuck, 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 chuck. Prices coordinate. No, no. People coordinate. They don't violate each other's property. They say, right, this is, this is mine. I can do this. You have problems with, of course, ex externalities. But that might be a problem for having a state trying to solve it for you and being purchased by various interests so as to not solve it very well or solve it in the wrong manner. I don't say how it's easier to get round that, but that is um, usually uh, not libertarians at work. It should be said, it's not their fault. So we have um, coordination without an overseer, no coordinator, even prices aren't doing anything. Uh, from previous talks you may know that I don't, I like to rob money of a mystique, the generation of money, that money is vital, but the idea that it powers, pushes, turns the wheels, uh, gets things going, uh, uh, as sadly most central banks now seem to imagine that that is the case, it has to be done in that way. Uh, I, I like to rob money of all its, its mystique. It's vitally important, but what happens is it's, people, it's money users who do, who do all the work, and the money does nothing. And certainly it doesn't provide information, it doesn't turn the wheels of industry, it doesn't uh, increase demand. Using money is demanding with money, though we also demand with non-money money, but don't want to confuse the issue further. So, what next? What else can I throw out? Um, well, economics, I would have thought. <laughs> that has to go itself. Um, apart from Telling, uh, telling the people that so, uh, an attempt to have socialism is, is, is murderous and foolish, and, 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 and that, that's a good use of economics. I, I can allow, I, I can see the point in that. Um, pointing out that protectionism and tariffs are silly, that um, allowing producers to produce. I mean, what's the point in having a nice new railway to make things easier to get from here to there? This is Bastia, when you then, <laughs> then shove a great block in the way by means of a tariff. You might as well build a mountain, an artificial mountain, to make them go, make it more costly to get in. That's, that, will, that was his point entirely. Or the invisible, the invisible railway is another one. It was so useful to have a, the railway stop at the town and everything be transferred across the town and onto another railway. He said, this is, this is wonderful. Let's have, let's have a railway that consists entirely of, of gaps. <laughs> the, the invisible railway. Yes. So he understood. So economists can be good for, the, good for that. They can be good on on free trade and anti-socialism. They can also be good on pointing out how markets could be got into some area, like with fishing or things of that kind, or pollution. Yes, they're handy for that. But the idea that economists sh can help people economise, no, 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 that's not their job at all. They can't, that's technicians, engineers, uh, chemists, all sorts of well, entrepreneurs, management, Techniques. These things uh, can can cut costs, can make for um, economising. But the economists are no help for that. Um, so sadly, um, sadly, we now have a great many economists, and nothing for them to do really, or very little way in which they can be of any use. But they're still there, and they're still being paid heed to, though only if it, only if the governments are told what they want to be told. 
pretty much, not entirely. Some of them do silly things so they think it's for the best. Because their advisors tell them. Ah, right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I've, I've reached a kind of Lachmanian position, this, 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 uh, this nihilist. Now, a nihilist, if you look it up, is not uh, someone who doesn't... He thinks things aren't only value. Not so much that you, you can't know certain things. And um, Lachman and others, other um, Utro Austrians, think they know very well certain things. They're not at all, uh, in that sense, uh, nihilists in the sense of uh, sceptics, complete doubters as to things. Um, I think, uh, well, Lachman's close to my position and therefore he's a good sort, I think, because he agrees with me. Well, I agree with him. Uh, in other words, you can have this inter interlocking, interdependent uh, set of producers, um, and yet uh, maybe getting no closer to equilibrium, and all the better for it, I've said in the past. So it must be true. Uh, we can do better than the op optimal. The optimal we can do with these techniques or these, these holdings of, uh, of assets, uh, well, we want a new method. We want, we, want, we want a way of doing better than that. In other words, it's sometimes thought that general equilibrium would be a good thing. All firms making a profit, all firms making equal profit. And um, that's another way of saying stagnant, going nowhere, developing nothing. Because ideas come first to some and not to others, pretty much. So um, I don't see what the, what the point is. Uh, but many American Austrian economists um, think, oh no, we have, to, we have to say at least it, there's a tendency towards equilibrium, otherwise it's, it's hell on earth. But I can't see why that is. There can be all sorts of inventions tumbling in one after the other. You know, th this cuts the cost of things in, enormously and then a different, different technique does it then. Or, <gasps> sometimes some are falling and some are rising. Hey, what's the problem? The stuff's gooder, uh, better, and, and cheaper. Isn't that the point behind this? We are, we're not trying to please some, some god who rather likes the idea of general equilibrium. I don't know. Uh, let us, let us um, go forward uh, together. So, Lackerman is no nihilist, and neither am I. Um, what are we doing? Oh, there we are. Uh, uh, what about predictability? Isn't that supposed to be part of economics? Well, so this is uh, me, uh, Friedman and others. The whole point is that you have, you have data, uh, functions, and uh, that's it. And you go and test it. That's science. That is. That's, that's what it ought to be. And, um, well, in some ways, even without this being particularly possible, it doesn't mean we're living in a, a, a world that could go, go to pieces at any minute. It, it, it does hang together because economic failure is because of economic success elsewhere. That's how it works. So there are things being supplied and produced. You needn't worry that my, or everyone might suddenly rush out and de decide to make nothing else but turnips. That's not going to happen. It's a logical possibility, perhaps, but they aren't going to do it. And uh, there's no reason to worry too much about the lack of knowledge of the future because the future will be things congenial to us, pretty much. And also the future, certainly the near future, looks very much like now, because it's, it, was, it was here a second or so ago, and it's still looking pretty much the same now. So it's not that much that we don't know about the future. I mean, no, it's going to be, um, it's going to be different, and if it's a commercial society, uh, it's a way of being better or being less bad than it might have been if it hadn't changed. Sometimes catastrophes mean that incomes will have to fall for a while, but still, uh, adjusting to it is the, is the best way to proceed. Ah, a bit more on knowledge. If you have a pizza delivery boy, uh, do, do we use his knowledge? 
Who uses his knowledge? He, he, of, of the route. He can, he can, he's been doing it for a year or so. He can nip about on his moped. He knows the quickest ways to get anywhere. Now, some, um, some people influenced by Hayek, not perhaps Hayek, think that, um, of course, we use his knowledge. Who uses his knowledge? No, we don't. <laughs> he uses his, his knowledge. We use his capacity to get to our place quickly before the pizza goes cold. That's it. He's providing us no information at all. His employer doesn't use his, his, his knowledge either. He uses his competence. Uh, another philosopher pops in here, Gilbert Ryle, uh, who famously spoke of knowing, knowing this and knowing that. No, yes, right. that knowing, knowing this, this and uh, knowing, uh, uh, knowing how and knowing that. That's right. And it's, it's from Heidegger, That's right. from his review of Heidegger. And th this applies in this case. In other words, knowledge. it's tacit knowledge. Now, elsewhere, of course, Hayek and others are very good on tacit knowledge. The idea that it can't be imparted to others. The whole uh, a knowledge of time and place, which Hayek is famously and rightly credited with, seeing that it's a knowledge of time and place that cannot be conveyed to a central uh, commander for them to then say, ah, right, given all that, we'll decide upon this. And that's true and, and uh, uh, of great importance. Except that, uh, well, no, no, I think Hayek will say this too, without the market order, you wouldn't be in that position looking to see the best way of doing things and acquiring knowledge. So it's not that he's in that particular industry or particular company seeing this array of prices, though they will have certain, the buyers will have knowledge of prices. But it's only because you're in that position with that speciality, that you look to acquire or pass on certain techniques, certain, uh, certain rules of thumb that you can't easily explain to another. I mean, they come into the firm, they, you can give them the odd word, they can see you at work and hear, hear what you're doing, and they acquire um, a kind of knowledge of time and place, that's true, and it can't be sent up to the bosses to tell you what to do, because if you had it, why would they? They wouldn't need to tell you. Uh, so, that, so that's true enough. But the important thing is you wouldn't acquire that knowledge of time and place and it would not be useful to you unless you were a commercial company in a constellation of commercial companies. That's how it works. And uh, obviously a, a communist society is not such a, such a thing. So they, they, can't, they can't be told and they wouldn't know what to do with it if they could be told. Uh, there is an idea of, I've even seen some people, uh, to be fair to them, they're just summing up the history of economics or something, and they talk about, oh yes, we aggregate knowledge. What the? That's like an aggregated telephone number. What's, uh, ag what's aggregated knowledge? I don't know what aggregated knowledge is. But they, it's not spoken of like that, but no, I can't make sense of that. So conveying, containing, signaling, oh, undoubtedly a, a, a price or set of prices could be a signal, but only in the kind of a code. You put a price up that was, it meant something else. But that's not as a price, that's as a, as parts of a, uh, of a coded message that would do it. So in that sense, no, the, um, there is no signaling by prices. Uh, like Sherlock Holmes drew a prepared mind with a set of uh, hypotheses to explain the phenomena you can get it right. You can jump to the right conclusion or rapidly discard the false hypothesis as you acquire further information. But um, there is no conveying, no containing, no signalling by prices. Relative scarcity, pa, we've already dealt with that. Uh, relative scarcity is a mere synonym for um, price change, which we already knew there was. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's a change in relative scarcity. How do you know that? Well, the price change. It's just another way of saying it. That's not helping at all. Now, obviously, it means that the supply changed or the demand changed or some complementary good demand or supply changed or some substitute good price 
or supply chain. Um, we, true, all true. But of course, since it's not telling you as any of that, you might as well find out in the other way by phoning around or asking people or reading the newspapers. Or hey, so um, price changes make you think. Uh, but do they help you get to the answer? No. Right. That's enough of that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions or comments? David? Yes. <laughs> we'll be the matter, I think. I'll let you know what it is. That's all. People usually don't report it down. Yes, I said that. That's my best. That's my best. No, carry on. A lovely talk and a lovely title. <laughs> uh, I suppose you might, I suppose you might say that the, what prices do is they, is they help you economise by saving you a lot of work. Because, of course, all this stuff keeps changing in the world. Um, like you say, alternative blah, blah, blah. And the thing that prices do, I suppose, is that you don't need to know any of that stuff. You don't do any investigation or research at all about how the environment change or the supply change or anything. Because you've got price. So I, I don't care why the price got to what it is. I don't need to know it. If I didn't have the price, if I didn't have the existing data to work out what to do, then maybe I'd have to do all this research to find out how much people want this stuff and, and what are the alternatives and and so on and so forth. Well, the is there, I don't have to. So well, except don't have that for reasons that Mises gave, it's impossible research. You cannot do the research to tell you what the mix of inputs ought to be to save real opportunity cost. Of course, you're not trying to do that anyway as a commercial op operator. But if you were, if you were a, 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 an official, communist official, you would have to, in a, in a way, try to do that. So the price saves me from doing that that can't be done either. Exactly that. Now, sometimes Hayek almost says that. He says, he says a, a price doesn't convey information, but it makes you do something that an informed commissar would tell you to do. Cut down on this, uh, switch to an alternative uh, input, which they would have to do in a, in a communist system, but could not, well, could not very well do. Yeah. John? So if you have some economics theory you can deduce things from <coughs> prices change but without that what a price does the information that it conveys to you maybe this is just another way of the point it's just like it is it tells you what you can afford uh, otherwise uh, which is very very important no, it, it, it changes the opportunity cost of proceeding in buying that product because yeah, it means you right. can't buy as much as usual of this or that. So you, if, if it goes up enough, if you're just a consumer, let's say, but you, I've made the point today, that I don't like the idea of consumers. I insist that everyone's a producer. Everyone. Everyone. Now, we don't all produce for cash sale. That's true. But we all produce. So we're all using inputs to get an output. My yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, but is that information? Um, Can I afford it? Yes, that's information. Can I afford it? No. No, the can I afford it depends upon what you know your income to be. The price doesn't know. You've got to know what your own income is. Yeah, your price doesn't know what your income is. It's not I'm assuming you have some. It's not giving you a tip off. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm denied that the calculation element. Uh, helps you come to a conclusion. Although you have to suppose whether the prices are going to be around as they are, and they may not. So you still have to do some work. And you're not helped by the price. The price is not going to help you at all. Oh, I'm only a temporary price. What does it say that? What does it say that? It doesn't say that. You have to um, think about it. Is there a strike? Is there a revolution? Was there an earthquake? You... Just yeah. Yeah, well, you, you just answered the question I was oh. going to, um, uh, to ask, and uh, following that, um, David has just said, uh, if the price of turnips uh, goes up, or the price of anything goes up, um, as you said, uh, 
that signals something. I know you didn't you mentioned the word signal as being one of the ones that, uh, that one should use, um, but you need to know why the price of turnip uh, went up. I mean, is it because uh, there is a strike? Is it because there is a, and, and therefore after a few days you will get your turnips again? Or is it because a turnip producing country has put an embargo on sale and that may take many months? Or there is some pest uh, 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 that has destroyed the crop. So then you have to wait for another year for another harvest. If you're a wholesaler, you would probably do that. If you're a housewife about to make a stew, you just go, well, no. Oh, yeah, well, that, yeah. That, that's right. But I mean, yeah, they're still, they're, they, still have, they still have production plans, but one doesn't have to think too much about yeah. them, the background. But then, yeah, but then you know that you won't be making stews for, with turnips for a very long time. Mm. So um, it's a. But I, I think what is important uh, is patterns of prices, movements of prices. And this is, of course, what traders, you know, technical traders famously say. I don't need to know whether this sequence of prices over one year, one month, ten years, is about tin or turnips or something else. Uh, I'm simply identifying resonances. I'm identifying patterns. And if the pattern is like this for X amount of time, then it will develop into something else into another pattern. So I can anticipate that pattern based on what has happened. Of course, this is how famously fortunes have been lost. But it's, it's one of the ways of trying but to I would say, prices. I would say the prices, isn't, the prices aren't telling you anything. That there are prices and you have a record allows you to conjecture as to the tendency, the trend, or just read off the trend. So it's going to be like previously. Yeah. But the price hasn't told you that. You need the prices to engage in such conjecture. Yeah, and then you need to do your Fibonacci ah. sequence or your four-year sequence or your whatever. I don't know the prices are necessary to make use of prices. Yeah. Well, exactly. I can't deny that. <laughs> but whether that's because you can get the juice out of them, I, I, don't, I don't know. David? In part, part of the... Part of the debate about the word the prices Context of the 1920s and 1930s debates about whether you could have prices without having a market. Uh, and uh, what, what one gets, what one needs to emphasize is that a price to be useful has to be a real price. Yes. In other words, it has to be a price that reflects. Uh, market transactions as, as, as opposed to being set by some government <coughs> body because if it's set by a government body then it, it actually is an entirely it is truly useless because you can't actually get the stuff at that price mm -hmm. the thing about a market price is that uh, if not much time has passed between the price and when you want to act in relation to the price you will be able to get the stuff at that price or something close a not real price a fake price, for example, fixed rents, you won't be able to, it looks like you can, as a price, but it's actually very misleading information. If you try and get your rent at £10 a week in London, as fixed by Jeremy, and there'll be a queue of 20,000 people, and there'll be another price to pay, which is waiting 10 years before you can get it. So actually, when we talk about prices, one of the important things about useful prices, even for that very mundane planning function by the individual, is they've been real. Because otherwise, they are what you think you can get. Honestly, you actually can't get, and that's incredibly disruptive. There has to be sufficient competition uh, within the order, within the society it produces, such that it's not a monopoly price. It's not a rigged price. It's 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 a price you can say, all right, okay. Now, given that, I'll. Ju I'll judge my investment, I'll judge my uh, you can purchase. Use it for oh, I don't deny that. But you can't use a, a, uh, a non market price because you have a whole lot of costs coming with it which you, which you either can't calculate or don't even know about. No, I don't dispute that. It's, it just hasn't told you anything. 
I mean, you make use of it, obviously. You have to know the size of something if you're going to, say, bury it. Um, but it doesn't help you bury it. I mean, it's a bit like that. It's, is that a bit literal? Um, possibly. But, uh, so, so in other words, uh, as I said earlier, I don't like the idea that prices have work to do, have a role to play. Uh, John Gilgood, the actor, uh, was talking about some new play, and he says, oh, it's, oh, it's ghastly, it's awful. Is there a part for me? So, <laughs> so it depends upon the role uh, things, things are playing here. And um, undoubtedly, we, we use, I don't even like to say prices, priced goods. Priced goods. That's what you're making, that's what you're considering. It's the, what's the, what is the good good for? Okay. That will physically get me the product I want. What's the price? Okay. That will allow me to get the product on sale above cost. If things work out okay. You know, if the customers are I, I expect them to be. Now, is that, is that an important distinction? Well, making use of the price... Of course, in a calculation, you can't calculate without something which is a, a numeral, a, a number, a part number. I don't think so. That's that's true enough, but that's not being. Dis I'm not disputing that in the slightest. It's just it won't tell you how long the price is going to last, uh, whether the customers will buy at that price. But obviously, you're not saying that either. So, so what? It's a precious thin bit of information, if anything at all is being conveyed or contained by this price. It, it may reveal that the punters are really keen on it. Uh, if a holy relic, or as I said the other day, uh, Elvis Presley's underpants, which came on the market the other year, because they can be shown to be Elvis Presley's underpants, I'm not sure they use DNA or just as, just the tra chain of evidence, as it were, but they were, they were undoubtedly Elvis Presley's underpants, and as such they sold for more. Ah, there could be blue suede underpants, indeed. Very good. But uh, so was the the fact that there was the now that in a way tells you something. If there's a lot of excess about, and people who expect to make money out of this, and people who don't want to be fooled by the uh, by the claims, they will look into it and see whether they actually are Elvis Presley's underpants. But again, the price doesn't help. The price will draw your attention to it. Mm. Are these genuine? That seems too cheap, or that seems too expensive, or, well, perhaps I don't know what the upper, upper, upper price would be for Elvis Presley's underpants, but still. Again, I come back to the point that the price invites you to inquire, compels you as a producer to think about it, but doesn't provide any data in thinking about it. It's a sort of a, a, a datum. It's there. Okay, now, I mean, what can I do around that to make a profit? Can I make a profit with this? It won't tell you how. What production plan to choose? Obviously one that doesn't require the price to be lower. <laughs> Unless you think it's about to fall. So, um, they were asking... I don't know. I think, I mean, just as, um, I think it was, um, was it Hayden came up with the regression theory of the value of money? Or was it before him? Um, Regression. Well, the, the, the regression theory of the value of money is that. Uh, oh, because, the, uh, yeah, because that was valuable and that was valuable and that was valuable. Yeah. And therefore, that became yeah. But the the ultimate uh, you know, sort of source of all, all values, all costs, uh, is really human time and energy. It's the amount of energy that a person has to put in into producing a particular good or service. And whenever anyone uh, goes into the effort of actually uh, producing. What they're choosing between is using their time and energy to produce one good or service that might be for their own consumption, or using their time and energy to produce another good and service that might be for someone else's good, good and uh, consumption, that they can then in return for that get something else that will give them a better satisfaction. And so at the end of the day, all the prices are kind of regressing back uh, to people's choices in what ways they're going to spend their time and energy uh, in, in, a, in order to, to satisfy their, their own particular wants and what they're going to charge to others 
for the time and energy they're spending for other people. But that, I think, is in a free market, the root source of all costs. The cost is someone else's time and energy. That, that is a famous uh, analysis of cost, but uh, it was poo poo during the 19th century. That, um, that was the idea of a real cost. It was a labour, it was an effort, it was something. And then they had to explain how pearls found in a riverbed had so much value. He just you know, walked along, there it was, picked it up, that's it, did, no, didn't do anything. Now, Bastiat sort of reversed it. He said, all right, the reason it's of high prices, it saves you from having to wander around for years, because your aunt was lucky, looking for a pearl. So he, it was a kind of saved labour theory of value, rather than an expended labour theory of value. But, yeah, but generally, the, um, the, the, that was thought to be not the whole story. Uh, I'd say, but there, there is something in it. There is something in it, but you can just be, you know, it can just be that whatever you've got becomes fashionable, or and the prices, you know, rocket off, and you've done nothing. Done nothing. I suppose the cost of actually producing a pearl is, is more than any one person can actually achieve. You just have to be lucky to find the place where the pearls have to be, uh, and the people in that place have the choice. They can either go down and swim with the pearls uh, and bring those up and then you know, give them over to other people who want them uh, for, you know, for other satisfactions, or they can spend uh, hard, long days slogging away uh, trying to, to grow very unproductive crops in unproductive soil. Uh, and so for their point of view, it's really just a natural choice for them to actually uh, take the but obviously not easy, but easier task of diving on the water and bringing a handful of pearls up, uh, and then trading that for what they want. The trouble is, it usually pays. It's a relative thing. It usually pays not to go off to the Klondike and dig for gold. You probably would have done better staying at home and running a. Well, it said the man who went there and sold shovels made more money, than, or is more certain of making money than those who look for gold. Have you? interesting actually to reverse the question and ask if you can have a market economy, have a market economy without prices. You don't actually get, if we not, and I don't know what it, it, it tells us, but I'll have limited examples. If you go into an uh, um, Arab shuk, for example, you can have a market, it's not a full market economy, but you have a market, and no prices. Oh. We don't like that. Well, we, we don't like that. We don't like that. Well, it, it exists. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I'm just wondering if that tells us something about But there's that. local knowledge of what the yeah, prices ought knowledge. to be, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. I suppose that's how it works. But yes. Well, they could do, see, you know, he asks for 100, you offer two. Yeah. <laughs> then he offers, you know, then you try to get it down. I suppose, as you say, we all have some knowledge of what the prices roughly ought to be. Uh, I'm just trying to imagine have an economy, a working economy, where all price information, where there are no published prices for anything for sale, and where all prices of things that are sold are kept secret, so that you can't know them. If you had memory, a good memory, <laughs> and price doesn't change too much, but, but if... The, uh, no, but you, you have to assume this purpose, that the only prices that you know are from your own personal transactions. Oh, you might is, be being conned. Everything else is secret, so you yeah. don't know what Interesting. prices things are sold for. And there aren't any price lists. Now, could that pick on your work? If it couldn't work, not really. Because you, you want to know what you're going to. doesn't work. You want to know what you're missing out on exactly. if you buy something. Yeah. Oh, okay. The next, so your, it's your other pro, it's your other purchases that count. It's, really, it's just trying to imagine a market economy without prices might be one way of seeing. What prices do, what information it oh, I see what you mean. any they convey. Well, of course, producers have suppliers. So you wouldn't sell the product if you didn't make a profit from all your suppliers. Mm. And, um, uh, and, and so, therefore, if you had bought you know, all the uh, inputs into your production, then 
you would know that you need at least that much from your consumers in order to live because you have spent all that money making that product. Of, yeah, obviously. So, so, so you know, you know price. Also, if your suppliers are conned you <coughs> and charge you far too much, you've got, you've got a business. So in the end, they have to charge a reason. They have to charge a market rate to yeah. allow you to so it's, it's, be, be purchasers in the yeah. future. So it's almost as though prices are bound to emerge. Oh yeah. yes, yes, yes. In transaction, exactly. Oh, it's, oh yes. I, I, I suppose that the um, Aztecs or Mayas, whether they were, uh, didn't know the value of gold. Um, you know, very rapidly after the Spaniards arrived, said, "Hey." <laughs> We, we, we are not going to sell it for a couple of, I don't know, mirrors. So, um... There, um there, there, there have been people who have argued, I don't know his name, that um, just lately, trying to boss, trying to sort of bitch slap, as it were, the um, free marketeers, they said, do you think there was barter? You think there was barter? Oh, David Gorb. And then it changed. Then it changed. Yes, there was never barter. Now, of course, economists, when they talk about a desert island yeah, or a barter yeah, economy, yeah, yeah. they're simply trying to explain things. Because what they're really explaining is there's no reason to suppose that barter would last five minutes. Or rather, there would soon emerge a good or a few goods that were the great, for, great for barter goods. You may not get what you really want, but you get something you can swap for what you really want, which, mm. which, is, money. which is money. It's <laughs> yeah, money. money. So, of course, they're right to say that barter didn't last long, unless you mean by barter, you know, what you trade for. So there, there might, might not be one good in particular, but, you know, we know, the, we know the arguments. It has to be something that will last, that is divisible, that is, mm. it can be checked up on the quality easily. And so, of course... In a sense, they're right. But many of the um, free market economists only said, they said this for um, reason, to explain to their pupils what's going on. They didn't actually think there was a whole thousand, you know, thousand year periods of barter. No, no. Although, well, funnily enough, as soon as you can't use money, prisoner war camps, prisons, then barter comes straight back in again. Although the, you often cigarettes emerge. Cigarettes are good, yes. And, are and good. other commodities emerge as a money commodity. In, uh, things that, hang, things that don't go off, things that are uniform, things that you can check on the quality of. Mm. Cigarettes, you can smoke them, <laughs> see if they're adulterated. <laughs> yes, so cigarettes work very well. Any other questions? Well, oh, thank you for the fine talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.